become interested in gerontology? It's a good question. Um, I certainly didn't take a straight route there. Um, I had been planning on being a counselor. I was in a psych program um, as an undergrad, and that had been my plan. And by the time I was headed to graduate school, I wasn't terribly happy with the kinds of programs that I was looking at, and I had some very strange experiences on the interviews there. So I decided to take some time off to really figure out what I wanted to do. And with a psych um, bachelor's, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, I ended up working in a group home for older adults. I was asked to start a group home for older adults with developmental disabilities. Um, not so much start it, but to help create it. I, there were people in, um, in the agency who were aging in, out of their home, their, their own group homes. And so I was part of the team to help create a, a new living environment um, so that people could retire and still meet the, uh, the card versus thorn. They have to have day programming and all that. But they were saying, you know, our, our guys were saying, you know, my family gets to retire, why can't I? And so I knew nothing about people with developmental disabilities and I knew nothing about aging. So apparently I was the perfect person to help with this. And after about six months of it, I was talking to my dad trying to figure out what I should do. And he says, well, you know, I think, you know, you should, there's a, probably a gerontology program up in, I think he's probably said aging, up in the University of Connecticut, which is where I had had my bachelor's. And so I called and I happened to get in contact with Nancy Sheehan, um, who eventually became my mentor. But um, I went back to, um, the, into their master's program in family studies and I became a gerontologist. It, it wasn't my plan, um, I just kind of ended up there. So you talked a little bit about your, your career, kind mm -hmm. of how you got there, but um, Talk about your career trajectory as a gerontologist. I mean, what, at what point did you embrace that term gerontologist? Ah, well, in, um, let's see, I would have graduated with a bachelor's in 86, so 87 I went back to school and it was a human development and family relations program and I was particularly interested in aging. Most of the other people there were, um, they wanted to be MFT counselors and that kind of thing. I was one of the very few people interested in aging. So I was already identified as those gerontology people. So I didn't see myself as a gerontologist, but there was only like one or two of us and we were the, those others, you know, the gerontology people. Um, I, I did a lot of research. I had a graduate assistantship with Nancy Sheehan, um, doing all sorts of research with housing for older adults. Um, I got to do a GSA, um, they had a fellowship at the time, a student fellowship at the time, um, and so we got to do that, and so people were starting to refer to, you know, you, you know using the gerontology kind of word um, a lot, and then I went, just, just because I'd been there for so long, I decided to, to pursue a, a doctorate somewhere else, and I went probably a long way around, but I ended up in the University of Delaware working for Tamar Haraven, who was a family historian. Um, she was very much into the life course perspective. She and Glenn Elder and several others were really quite at the forefront of, of some of the, the, the details, and so that's where I learned some of it. Um, I probably didn't consider myself a gerontologist until I had my first job, which would have been in 93. Um, at the time, when I was applying for jobs, um, there were only three that were out there. There was one in Canada, there was one at St. Cloud State University in Minnesota, and then there was one doing research um, in Philadelphia. And I was really looking for, I was planning on being a research person. And when I was up for both, I obviously didn't, the Canada job didn't want me, but um, I was up for both and I'd been offered the tenure track job at St. Cloud State and I told the researchers um, who I, you know, what I was, I was like, well, where am I in the process? And um, a very kind Miriam Moss said, if you were my daughter, and my daughter's been looking for one, if you were my daughter, I'd say, take the tenure track job. And so I did. And I've been at St. Cloud State ever since. I didn't plan on staying there, um, but I um, joined the gerontology program there. Um, I believe I was about 27 at the time. 
So it was a little odd to be teaching aging, but apparently I became the gerontologist. We were in a department of interdisciplinary studies. We've in, been in many different departments since then um, as departments go away. But I guess that's when I became a gerontologist, at some point when I started teaching. Um, did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? I think Nancy Sheehan would have been one of them. She's at the University of Connecticut. I believe she's recently retired. But um, I was always so impressed. She let me work on research with her. Um, she guided me. Um, she was the one who convinced me to apply for um, the GSA Student Fellowship, Summer Fellowship. Um, and she went with me through the process. So that was really an exciting thing. Um, I don't think they have that particular program anymore, but you would have a mentor which was Nancy, and then you'd have an agency mentor as well, and then you'd have someone in DC as well. And so um, I had people like Lori Simon Rosinowitz as one of our uh, GSC people, and so we had, there was just really a lot of wonderful people, but probably Nancy would be the, the most of a mentor. I did work with Tamara Haraven. Um, I learned a great deal from her. Um, I worked with Kate Conway Turner, who I learned a great deal about publishing from. Um, and, I mean, so there were many women that I, I worked with, but I think Nancy was probably the primary one who really moved me in that direction. What do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Unique about being a woman gerontologist? Well, it seems to me that a lot of my cohort of gerontologists are women. Um, I imagine the earlier cohorts probably were not, but I was surrounded by women. Um, I went into a department um, where there were only female faculty for gerontology. We were also the only female faculty in the department, but gerontology was female. So I, it just was how it was. Um, okay, so how is being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? That's an interesting question. Um, as I mentioned, when I first got to St. Cloud State, I, I'm the last year of the baby boom. I'm a, I was born in 64. And I had no teaching experience except for, uh, you know, a couple of those where grad students, you know, grab a class in the summer and, or you, you, you teach a, your TA and do a couple of lectures in the really big, you know, sections. But I got there and I was planning on being a researcher and all of a sudden I'm at a comprehensive university with a, at the time we were at um, on quarter system, so it was a 3-3-3 three, three, three load. We're now in semesters, it's 4-4 four, four load. Um, and I forgot what the rest of the question was. Just how it's, how being a gerontologist has um, ah. affected your personal I was rather young to be teaching some of our students and I had many opportunities that I didn't necessarily realize how much they were going to impact my life. When I first got there in 93, um, a woman came to me from the community and she said, I'm a volunteer coordinator at this multi-level care facility. I've been reading about service learning and your students should do it. Um, I did not know at the time that that would then become one of my areas of interest for research. Um, people weren't doing it at the time. I'd never heard of service learning but it really changed where I was headed. Um, but I was very young, and so I, I didn't really know a whole lot about the pedagogy because I hadn't really studied teaching. Um, I did have an opportunity very early on to team teach with another faculty member. Um, we had a, a American Studies program, and she wanted to team teach Women in Aging with me. And it was very interesting because we were baby boomer bookends. And we were both in the classroom at the very same time. And this is Pamela Middlefelt, amazing, amazing teacher, and just an amazing writer and researcher. Um, and I was brand new teaching. I'm thinking, how am I going to team teach along? But I figured I'd learn. And we had a grant to do this. It was a really interesting program. Um, and so we got into the classroom teaching women and aging. And she had the, the American studies and the, the women's studies background. And I had the gerontology background. And we thought, that's no problem. And then we hadn't talked exactly how we were going to start the class, and so her idea was that we were going to tell everybody our ages. And I didn't want to tell people my age. 
And you have to understand it wasn't because I thought I was old. It was because there were students in their 50s in the class and I was still in my 20s. And I even had one review um, at one point, a student who, um, a very interesting dynamic when you team teach. Um, sometimes students go towards one faculty member or another and we were trying to demonstrate that you can disagree and, and think critically and, and sometimes it looked like we were, I wouldn't say attacking each other, but because um, where I was in Minnesota, people didn't disagree. They call it Minnesota nice, which isn't really about niceness, but you don't disagree, at least not openly. And I'm not from Minnesota, and um, my colleague you know, had no problems with it either. So we were trying to demonstrate how to disagree pleasantly and, and how to do this. Um, but there were some students who felt that I was being disrespectful to the senior faculty member. Um, they did not like me. And they thought that I was too young to be talking to them about aging. And they probably were right, um, as I think of it now, and probably as I was thinking of it then. Um, but I learned a lot of lessons that way. So I started out being too young in my mind and kind of grew into it, I guess. Um, you, you learn things, you know, and it's not more age, but experience. The more you do things, um, we team taught several years before we didn't have the grant anymore. And, very smoothly after that. But she wanted to demonstrate that women shouldn't be afraid to tell their ages. That was her thinking. And so she was very proudly, you know, the first year of the baby boom and, you know, born in 1946. And I was like, oh, because I knew it was going to be a challenge. I should tell you, I have a tendency to forget the second parts of questions, so you can no, that's okay. keep me going. I'm just wondering how that thinking might have shifted. Well, for the personal part. Okay. Um, I turned 50 this past June. Um, and, you know, teaching about aging and working with older people in the community is very different than your own aging, but even more so with aging parents. Um, I grew up in a family where my father was physically um, disabled. Um, but also one of my greatest mentors, you know, he was the one who actually said, you can learn anything, call them up, see what kind of programs they have. So I, I really credit my dad for that. Um, and he had to switch careers when he was no longer able to uh, move about as much. Um, and so now I'm watching them age and they've been in their house for 50 years. And housing is one of my specialties and he could not walk stairs and yet they were in a front to back split level house and there's, you know, it, it was against everything I knew should be um, from the time he was in his 20s and he refused to move. And so now I'm looking at it and I had to try and convince him that it was time to move to another place. He was ready, but my mother really didn't want to. Um, so they've been there in a senior apartment now for a couple years and he's adjusted much better than she has. Um, we've all been kind of caretakers. Um, in various forms. Um, so it's very different when you're trying to convince your parents to do something because you realize parents are never going to let you parent them. They're not. They're always going to be your parents. Um, and so that was an interesting experience. I had um, grandparents who were alive uh, while I was still teaching when I had started teaching, I had a um, uh, grandmother on one side and a grandfather on the other who both lived well into their 90s. And I would come home visiting. I, I, lived, I was born in the East Coast in Connecticut. And I would visit, and they would do things like try and give me money, even though I had a real job. And in this whole reciprocity thing, I knew all the research. You know, you have to let people, you know, she knew I'd, you know, and so, yeah, okay, $5, even though, you know, she knew what I, you know. And, and it was still very hard for me to accept it, even though I knew that my students were having a tough time if you know, one of their service learning partners would give them cookies and they would feel embarrassed about taking them. And I'm like, it just felt very, what you know and you can talk about reciprocity and it's not the same when it's your own parents and grandparents. Um, and um, you know, your own aging kind of thing. I did have children rather late, and my husband is 
um, about eight years, eight and a half years older than I am. So when I went to St. Cloud State, um, he left his job to follow me. And I wanted to get tenure, and he wanted to have children. Um, and so I said, well, we can try, but if we have children, you have to take care of them. Um, and so he became a stay-at-home dad. And so, you know, there's all these different milestones going on. Last year I turned 50, two days before my eldest turned 18. Um, but my eldest was born while my husband was already 40. So he would often be called, um, he, the people would think he was babysitting his granddaughter. So there was a gender dynamic. There was the age dynamic. He has white hair and a white beard. Um, and so you kind of like, well, I'm not old enough to be married to someone who looks like a grandfather. You know, I have a little infant here. So there's all those little aging kinds of things going on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how else it would have done that. Um, I'm actually probably healthier now than I was a couple years ago, so I know I teach health and aging too. Um, I know that it's convinced me to do some things that I wouldn't otherwise do. You know, when you teach health and aging, you talk about preventative medicine and, you know, okay, at this age you need to do this and at this age you need to do this. Um, my, it was really a pain. I couldn't convince my husband to have his colonoscopy until he was 56, so it took me six years. Well, I turned 50, and man, I wanted to put it off, and you know, and I put it off a couple times, but he's like, you can't teach about that if you don't do it. Money where the mouth is, kind of thing, so to speak. So, um, I don't know if that answers that, or. Um, the Legal Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. And within that framework, is there anything else you want us to know? That's interesting, because I don't consider myself to be an older woman gerontologist. Um, in fact, I'm still younger than many of my colleagues. Um, I'm younger than my colleagues who have been there less time. I've been in my job for 22 years. Um, I work with someone who is older than I am, but is, has not been there as long. And so I'm, I'm always, I was, I have always been the youngest person in, whichever department we are in. Um, right now there's only two of us, so I'm still the youngest. Um, I've, I've been the youngest pretty much forever. I was the youngest child, and, and so I don't think of myself as an older gerontologist, even though I've done a lot, I would say. Um, I, I don't think of myself as an older gerontologist. I think I have about 20 more years before I'd even think about stopping, and I'm not even sure that then I would do that. Um, but even if I wanted to retire, um, you know, I'm not eligible to Social Security until I'm 67, and that's 17 years away. Um, I have a daughter in college, first year freshman, and a daughter who's a, f a freshman in high school. Um, so I have two children to get through college. Um, I just don't see myself as an older gerontologist. I'm not sure if that helps or, um, you know, I'm still dealing with all the things that my my younger colleagues are dealing with because I started rather late with the children. I catch you on a follow-up project in 20 years. Yeah. See if that changes me. I know my students see me as older. I always have them guess my age when I come into the classroom the first time. Um, and, and that was a really big shift from not wanting to tell my age um, when I was working with um, Pamela Middlefeld to realizing that students had expectations. And my colleague Prior to the last colleague, um, she was in her 70s before she retired. Um, and so I guess Ellie Stokes would have been another role model because she just kept on working and teaching and it was her love. And so I, you, know, you don't really think about, well, stopping. No one really thought about Ellie stopping and she was in her 70s. Um, so even then, you know, if there's two of us, she's in her 70s and I'm in my 20s and 30s. I know that my students, though, if you'll ask them, so how old do you think I am? Um, they used to be wrong in the wrong direction, where they used to think I was much younger than I was. Um, now they're really right on target, <laughs> and I'm not sure what that means <laughs> or what that says. Um, but I'm in a different place when I say, you know, how old is old and am I old? And it's a very different kind of thing as I age into it. I see the students, I don't know if you're familiar with the Beloit College list of uh, freshmen, um, 
I was looking at that and I realized that my freshmen were born in the mid to late 90s. Um, and I shouldn't be surprised because my eldest is born in 96 and she's a freshman, but I still have trouble having students that were born in their 80s, born in the 1980s. So the 1990s and it, it I mean, I know that time goes on, but not in my mind. It just kind of keeps going without me. Thank you. Thank you.